Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks, and welcome to episode 282 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. Well, it's been an interesting week, to say the least. I've been unboxing new equipment, scraping and pressing heather honey frames, and witnessed a most disturbing scene. A mute swan attacking another mute swan at the Fishing Lakes Apuries. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. Hi everyone, welcome back to the podcast. It's Sunday morning and, drum roll please, there's a frost outside. It's taken a while for it to finally arrive, but it now feels like late autumn has remembered what the weather conditions are supposed to be like and hit us with a very chilly start. I think it's the first real frost of this autumn and follows on from all the flooding that we've had to endure. For the beginner beekeeper, it's the start of a worrying time. Perhaps the entire season has been a worry for you if you're new to beekeeping. Each part of our beekeeping season seems to throw up a potential disaster in the waiting, it seems. Spring sees the delivery of a new nucleus colony and the stresses of moving it into a full-size hive. Swarming immediately follows, the inevitable worrying about pests and diseases, a missed honey crop when everyone around you at the beekeeping association are telling you that they can't reach the top super of five or six that they've had to add to their hive because it's been such a good season. Following on from that, the treatment phase, new beekeepers struggling to understand what treatment to use and the imminent danger of overdosing their bees with whatever treatment they decide to choose. Autumn feeding quickly follows on. Have you fed them enough? Did you give them too much? And now the brood nest has disappeared, which must surely mean that the queen is dead. And now the winter chill kicks in. And are the bees going to be able to survive this horribly cold weather that's bound to last for months and months? Well, all I can say is keep calm and wait it out. Whatever stage you find yourself at with your beekeeping and the jobs you have or haven't done, the bees will ultimately sort themselves out and you can recover the situation if recovery is required easily enough, with of course a little help from me. Remember, it doesn't matter how much you worry about what's happening, it's not going to help, so don't worry. Know that your bees are, for the most part, experts at seeing out the winter, and in the spring, you'll be able to see what's going on and deal with it in plenty of time for the new season. Thinking about this morning's cold start, and the frosts that I can see as I peer out of my office window, the effect on our bees isn't as damaging as you might think. In fact, it's going to be dealt with easily by most colonies. Once the temperature drops to single figures Celsius, our colonies will start to cluster. That's to say, the adult bees gather together around the brood nest area with the queen and link together to both generate warmth and keep that warmth tucked within the large ball of bees. And that's the thing we call a cluster. Our bees are perfectly designed to overwinter like this. Everything slows down, both physical work and metabolically speaking and it leaves us beekeepers with a chance to get out and do a little bramble clearing tidying up or some equipment cleaning and repair work that is if you're up to date and have everything else sorted this beekeeper is anything but i'm so far behind where i wanted to be this year that steph jokingly said it will be christmas before we get all the honey off the hives Well, at least I think she was joking. I like to think it's not all my own doing, and with the various delays I've encountered, it has allowed me to get cracking on some of the other jobs and work that would have been delayed until after the new year. I've been over to the workshop to tackle all of the dirty frames that need sorting. You'll have seen my videos on wax rendering, frame boiling and scraping in previous seasons, These things just come around every year and they have to be done. 
I can't say that I enjoy it, but once you get started, it's surprising just how quickly you can power through a couple of hundred frames. The rendered wax pile is certainly growing. We have over 150 kilos of the stuff now. One of the other targets for my working week at the workshop is a pile of previously cleaned frames. I have several different types and it becomes frustrating when you're working in a colony and the brood frames are all different. The same size, you understand, they're all Langstroth, but just different by a small margin. And this is because different manufacturers have slightly different ways of making their frames. Also, some are self-spacing, while others have the additional spaces added. So I intend sorting through them so that in the spring, when we carry out our double brood splits, we'll have a box full of the same type of frame. Now that will be a major step forward. It will also open up a large amount of space at the workshop, which again will help with getting organised. Some of these frames will need rewiring, but that's a simple enough task and one for January and February. Here in Norwich, where I can at least get some heating on in the unit and make the place warm enough that my fingers don't go numb. If anyone out there is also using Langstroth hives, I've decided to create a little more space by selling a large number of the refurbished poly hives. I have too many for my own needs now, so want to create a bit more space and hopefully help out someone who wants to expand the number of colonies they have at an affordable price. So do get in touch if you're after a low cost way to build up your Langstroth colony numbers. The reason I've been at the workshop once more is because the saga of the new honey wax separator continues. I was so excited at the beginning of the week. The delivery, which had been delayed and delayed, was finally confirmed and booked. The driver phoned to give an exact time and at the duly appointed time, he arrived with said pallet delivery, offloaded it and left me to unwrap it. The story takes another twist here in that... The reason for the delayed delivery, I suspect, is that the wax honey separator has been smashed around in transit and was dented and bashed, so much so that we've had to arrange for a replacement unit to be sent over to us from Carl Fritz. Now I have to say, despite my frustrations boiling over last Friday, both Rob at the Bee Farmers Association and Carl Fritz the manufacturers have, I think, done as much as possible to try to get this piece of equipment to me. Now, I suspect that Brexit hasn't helped the process of importing from Europe and the calamitous UK transport network did their best to frustrate me too. We now have to wait for an update as to when I might get the replacement unit. By way of explanation, the wax separator is designed to be bolted to the floor and for the purposes of transportation, Carl Fritz had screwed the unit to the pallet but the screws, I think, were not really man enough for the job and simply pulled free. That said, it looked like the unit had taken a mighty bash on the top edge of the drum hinge, which in turn may have been the cause for the legs being ripped from the pallet. And it's not a cheap piece of equipment, and it would have been much better if rather than cardboard for protection, the unit had been encased in a similar way to the Swenty Appy Melter that I purchased some years ago, sealed in a wooden frame. Even then, it may not have protected the wax separator, given the amount of damage to the top. So I've bolted the damaged one back to the pallet in readiness for its return journey, and will just have to be patient, I guess. This, then, has caused a further delay also in getting the honey out of the supers that came back from the heathermores. I know, it's still waiting. What I have discovered is that we took rather more borage honey to the moors than I would have liked. It does mean the total heather honey production isn't as good as I had hoped for, but, and here's some positive news for a change, the blended honey of borage and heather is really rather good. Now, that's not my opinion either. I did a honey tasting with some customers and they all agreed that the flavour of the blended heather slash borage mix is a gentler taste and not as powerfully strong as pure heather and therefore more generally liked. Obviously, there are those that still prefer the strong flavours of pure heather honey and it's a bit like those who 
want to eat the hottest chilli or those searingly hot curries. Some people just want the strong taste, and heather honey certainly delivers that. But lots of people don't, and I think this accidental blend could be just the ticket. As well as waiting for my delivery, I've been cracking on with some manual pressings on the heather honey. Again, I need to remind myself that next year we're going to focus on cut comb heather honey. It's so much easier. That said, it is quite therapeutic, the uncapping and scraping of super frames. The process, for those who haven't listened to my previous podcasts and noted the physical properties of heather honey, are that, being thixotropic, Heather honey can't easily be extracted unless you have a variety of torture chamber type equipment to hand. This jelly-like honey needs to be uncapped and scraped back to the middle foundation into a holding tank and then transferred to the press for squeezing out. The best bit of kit for this? A stainless steel burger flipper. Honestly, its blade is wide enough to scrape almost an entire width of a super frame It's flexible, yet stiff enough to be able to put pressure into the blade to help it scrape back to the foundation, and it really makes life a little easier with this entire task. So I've been working my way through supers, selecting frames of pure heather honey and leaving the ones with borage in, in the hope that it will still be okay to put through the wax separator should it arrive before Christmas. Remarkably, The borage has stayed liquid and not granulated. A real surprise for me. Surprise because I've never been this late in extracting borage or, to be honest, any other honey apart from ivy. I had anticipated it being set firm, but fortunately, keeping it in the sealed cells within the frames appears to have kept it in its runny state. So these frames are being set aside and I continue to work my way through the heather honey frames, scraping and pressing as I go. I'm also getting the hang of the fruit press finally too. It's been another steep learning curve. If you don't get the top plates on perfectly level and get the pressure downwards perfectly even, the entire top plate shifts to one side, adds too much sideways pressure, and the entire pressing cage starts to wander across from one side to the other. It's been another frustrating exercise trying to work out what I'm doing wrong, but I'm glad to say I do think I'm getting the hang of it. I should be an expert by the end of February. While I'm talking honey, I had a fun conversation with a fellow beekeeper about the joys of fermenting honey jars the other day. He too had his first crop of heather honey this year, and having got it into jars and set it aside, found that some of the jars had honey running down the outsides, despite being careful, he said, when filling them. Then came the inevitable phone call from someone who had a lid pop off while opening it, caused, of course, by fermenting honey. It turns out that the honey had gone into the jars with a water content of around 23%, and as a result of being moved from a cool location into a warm kitchen, Nature got involved, wild yeasts started to grow, and the pressure built up. That, of course, got me running for my refractometer to double-check the water content in our heather honey. It had been sat in the warm room for too long, really, albeit without any heat, so I guess you'd call that a cold room. Anyway, as the honey was running out of the press, I took a sample. 19% and a sigh of relief from me. You see, when I first brought the honey back from the heather moors, I already knew that the water content was likely to be quite high. So I had the heater on in the warm room for several days with a dehumidifier running. It looks like it paid off as several checks later and the honey was still at 19%. If you don't have a refractometer, I would add it to your Christmas wish list. They're relatively inexpensive and take the guesswork out of understanding the likelihood of your honey having too much water in it and the potential for fermentation. It's not just heather honey that this affects, of course. I'll pop a link into the podcast notes to one that I've used myself so you can take a look at what I'm talking about. Changing the subject, I wanted to mention a word on planning for the new season. 
We had our coaching Zoom meeting this week. It was a fun session in which we shared some thoughts on the last month and where things are headed. And I touched on planning for the new season. My plans have been challenged by the reoccurrence of my bad back problems. It's a literal pain in the back and something I've been aware of for most of the latter part of this season. It means that if I'm going to keep beekeeping for many years hence, I need to be very protective of my back. And as a result, I've decided that I won't look to build colony numbers beyond the 150 mark as I had intended a couple of years ago. This is very good news for all of you, of course, because if I'm not growing the honey production side of my business to that extent, it means I have more time for coaching, mentoring and videos. I'll talk through my full 2024 plan over Christmas and the new year, but for now, I want to suggest, respectfully suggest, that if you haven't started thinking about what you'd like to do next year with your beekeeping, then now is a great time to start. Whether you have one hive or 100 hives, planning will make your beekeeping journey next season that much easier. Finally today, I was at the Fishing Lakes Apecury yesterday, checking up on the colonies there, oh, and walking Marley the Cockapoo, when I was startled by a commotion coming from the nearby lake. I walked over to see what was going on, and was horrified to see a large mute swan attacking another slightly smaller mute swan. It had climbed onto the back of its victim and, unbelievably, was holding its head, that's the head of the smaller swan, beneath the water in an attempt to drown it. I've never seen anything quite like it before. It was really quite disturbing. I think the victim must have strayed into the larger bird's territory, but even so, I hadn't expected to see this. I've certainly never seen it before. I'm glad to say the smaller bird struggled and battled to the bank of the lake where it managed to clamber out and walk away down the track. The bigger swan seemed satisfied that it had got rid of its competition but swam backwards and forwards in the lake displaying its rather large wings and making one heck of a racket. I'm always amazed at how our natural world is so beautiful and yet so violent at the same time. I do have a small amount of mobile phone footage, good old mobile phones, and I'll post it to Patreon so you can see what I mean. But be warned, it is a bit of a horror show. Well, that's it for this week. Don't forget to check out my website, www.norfolk-honey.co.uk. And for my latest videos and podcasts with more updates, tips and techniques, it's the same Patreon page, www.patreon.com forward slash Norfolk Honey. And remember, I'm Stuart Spinks, and that was beekeeping short and sweet. Sweet.